Hey there, welcome to GSPN's Milwaukee Bucks trade deadline recap. We've got so many big moves to talk about, like, well, maybe we don't have that many. The Milwaukee Bucks acquired Patrick Beverly and a roster spot. Really excited about uh, luxury tax savings, but probably also a player. We'll have that discussion. And of course, we'll talk about Patrick Beverly, what the Bucks gave up, what the Bucks didn't get, what other teams got, all of those good things. But first, I am one of your hosts, Ty Windish. Joining me as always are the illustrious Adam McGee, Jordan Tresky, and Rohan Cotty. Full squad on deck. Fellas, as we always do, let's start it off. How's it going? Anyone? It was uh it was a pretty it was a pretty quiet uh trade deadline in terms of like big moves. So you know what? I'm doing I'm I'm all right, Ty. Okay. When when everyone is looking to see the floor on the question being, how's it going? <laughs> all right seems you know maybe the best you can hope for. I'm with Rowan. I'm all right. I am whelmed. I would say I'm whelmed. I think whelmed is fair. That's pretty much where I'm at. I was distraught in the moment. I had a lot of coffee right around the actual deadline. <laughs> And I'm seeing like things come through just after. I'm like, is this it? Is this going to be it? Is this the the defensive player we've all been dreaming about? And nothing else did happen. So let's get into what the Bucks actually did before we talk about what they didn't do. Milwaukee trades Cameron Payne, a 2027 second round pick. This is a Bucks pick, so uh, easily the less valuable of their two total. Now just one second round picks. They maintain Portland's 2024 second, which I believe is still currently 35th in the draft and is probably locked into no worse than like 36 realistically given there's like five teams in the league that are aggressively trying to be bad and Portland is one of them and there's a lot of teams in their conference that are not trying to be bad that will finish ahead of them so the Bucks maintain that but they send Payne the 2027 second to Philly to get Patrick Beverly obviously a defensive minded guard honestly like what three, four, or five years ago would have been the player we all wanted the Bucks to get. A lot mm-hmm. older now, uh, but still having a pretty good season. I actually saw highlights from it, their game against Boston where he looked outstanding on both ends. That is one game, but still, uh, it's still in there somewhere. Also, many have made the point: someone who brings whatever value you put in it. That dog mentality to the Milwaukee Bucks. I think Pat Bev fits the bill. They also traded Robin Lopez and Cash, and maybe got Cash back. They didn't get any. Anything of substance back, we'll put it that way, uh, to open up a roster spot. Robin Lopez going to the Kings, and I believe is being released. Uh, Robin already joked he hopes that Sacramento will retire his number, uh, so hopefully they do. He also reminisced fondly on his memories with Patrick Beverly as a teammate. So a lot of good stuff from Robin Lopez on Twitter today, who seems to be taking all this news relatively well. Uh, so those are the Bucks' moves, all of their moves. There is no DeJounte Murray, no Bruce Brown. Those guys both stayed put. Uh, this is news to Adam, by the way, who was at a film and missed a lot of trade deadline, which is extremely on brand. So we will be breaking news to Adam throughout the show, which I think is going to be very fun. Uh, so we'll start with you, Adam. You came in all this later. Your initial reaction in our chat was not the most overwhelmed at Pat Bev and you know a blank space. What are your thoughts on Milwaukee's trade deadline? Did you expect more going in like I did? And where are you at now after kind of processing everything for a couple of hours? Well, first and foremost, where it used to be you'd take Sophie out for a walk and book stuff would happen, it truly is when I like close myself off from the world and I'm like, oh, I gotta watch this movie. Uh, Adrian Griffin gets fired, trades <laughs> start happening. So I'm just I'm trying to do my part and do some you sacrifices watch a lot in of movies, that. Which probably explains yeah. why the Bucks have been so chaotic. <laughs> There's a lot of opportunity for stuff to happen. It's not I've given them every opportunity to do some deals as well as the other part of that, and I guess they took me up on it eventually. Uh, Jordan opened by saying he's whelmed. I am incredibly underwhelmed. This is not moving the needle for me at all. Part of that is, hey, this is a trade deadline. I have no doubt they tried to do a whole lot more. We've heard all the reports of the, the types of players they'd look to do, and Ultimately, it comes down to, well, what can you get done? What can get over the line? And I guess this was it. Um, Beverly is a better fit in theory than campaign. He's also 35 years old. I will not pretend to have watched all of the Patrick Beverly game tape this year. 
I would have expected him to regress defensively. And in a little bit of reading I'd done, that seems to be the consensus. He isn't the guy he was. I guess the hope is that maybe he can in a way that I guess we called upon with PJ Tucker before. It's like when the lights are brightest or where it's really time to lock in, he'll be able to deliver in a way that might be reminiscent of, as you said, Ty, I think the the guy who five years ago might have been the perfect fit here. And beyond that, I just think the books, whether it would have been wise for them to make a big deal and it might just come down to they didn't have the assets and the price would have been too high and it would have been all too drastic on top of what's already been a pretty drastic few weeks. I think if you wanted to really correct course on this season in a way where everyone could feel great about it and this team would be in pole position to go and come out of the East or to really even... I guess, put it up to the Celtics or not have too much fear about the likes of the Cavs or the Knicks rising too. I, I just think more was needed to be done. I think this team does need a wing defender. This team certainly needs a playable big. There is one open roster spot. I have learned, and I will salute Jordan, because I used to get excited about buyout season every year, and Jordan is all like, it's nothing, and it doesn't work out. And more often than not, that has been the case for the books. They have not been where solutions have come from. So I think going into a deadline where if the books were to get where we would have wanted them to get, they had a lot to do. I don't think they've come close to meeting that. I'm kind of fine with that because it aligns with where I have been. I know it's not where everyone else has been, but with the decision to fire a coach midseason, with the decision to bring Doc in and all the timing of that, my expectations are incredibly low for what's left basically don't embarrass yourselves don't lose in the first round again get to a second round and if you can figure it out well hey you'll have a chance at your talent to win that kind of series and if you can get to a conference finals anything is possible but this team is not to me still trending we can say they're trending up in terms of the defense looks like there's some life in it um but it's not trending up fast enough and nor do i think the pieces are there that unless I guess some details click, some things click, and maybe that's like even within what's a very strong starting five when they're out there. I I think it's easy for us to sell that as, look, the book's best five guys are as good as anyone. There are issues with the bench, and when they are meshed into groups that aren't that starting five, I don't think Patrick Beverly is solving that alone either. I, I really do think they kind of needed two to three very playable guys. And now, I guess part of it is we were all prepared for the potential departure of Bobby or or Pat, Pat Connaughton, that is. We've got two Pats now. Um, Pat Con and Pat Bev. It's now in a place where those two guys are around. They need to they need to rediscover. At least one of them needs to rediscover something that was key to book success in the past. So I don't know how great I feel about that, but by the time the playoffs come around, if the books are to be a factor, we're going to need a much better version of Bobby Portis and or Pat Connaughton than we've had lately. So that's where I'm at. I mean, he will be useful. I think there is a logic to the fit. I do have some concerns over his history with Dame, and I think it would be easy to just wave that off and be like, they're pros and everything's going to work out. But this has been a weird season for the books on a lot of fronts, and they're trying to kind of mesh a lot together. Patrick Beverly is a combustible character. It could work to their advantage because, as we said, maybe they need a dog. Maybe the dog is going to be, you know, nipping at the heels of everyone in the Bucks locker room. We'll see. We'll find out as as the rest of the season plays out. We have heard from both men already on this. We have. So, Pal, I didn't know if you were aware. So, Uh, no, I've seen it. I just sure. Patrick Beverly said it's lip service until we see otherwise. He's got to fix his relationship with Dame. And Dame, I thought this was so funny. I mean, maybe you have to be like as obsessed with the mechanics of it all as I, but. Like after the trade broke, well before it would have been official, he gives a statement to Chris Haynes, Dame does. And it's like, sad to see campaign go, excited to work with Patrick Beverly and, and move forward as a team and everything else. And I was like, normally you wait until like it's official maybe or no, like I'm like five minutes after. Like clearly that you know, the question was asked and Dame was like wanting to get ahead of it. Um, hopefully it's not an actual distraction. I, I wouldn't think so, but there is an old funny Dame tweet about Beverly that he's just running around yapping out there and whatever else, which is, is all in good fun. Um, hopefully we'll see. Uh, Jordan, 
What is your uh, extended thought on the Bucks' return and position now? Um, I had tried to not get worked into kind of the names that have been floated around the Bucks universe over the last couple of days. I had kept thinking in the back of my mind of what I believe Woj had said probably a few weeks out and saying, basically since the Doc move, and saying the big move that the Bucks have already made with their coach. And it's deadline. I'm sure a lot of these scenarios that have been floated around eventually get reported. We feel like it's really palpable. It's like, okay, maybe there's some, you know, there's this is missing from a deal or, or a package or picks aren't right, right where one team wants to have it than the other. To me, I just thought like you look at where the Bucks are at. A lot of the stuff of like what Jake Fisher from Yahoo Sports was kind of reporting was they're canvassing the league. They're working all these different scenarios and all that stuff. And part of me was like, yeah, that's what you do. This is really, you know, opportunistic kind of thing. And then the other part of me was like, well, this also like reeks of desperation. Yeah. You know I mean, like we all, everybody knows where they're at. And just to like find some kind of stop gap solution, you're trying to like look for any, anybody. For me to go to, you know, it's not like the Bucks have not worked with, I mean, they literally traded T- Tory Craig for a cash saving deal and then eventually play them in the finals, you know, months later. But I did think like, okay, I didn't really think that they would trade with a rival or someone that would they would possibly face to go out of the East. Obviously, I've been proven wrong there. Um, Doc's words of like, you know, if you're going to have fear of the deer, you got to have that or whatever he said in his introductory press conference, still lip service. But when I, when I said like, oh yeah, Pat Beverly, like you really want to restore some heart and soul in this team, which we all can say at various times of the season, we have felt like they have been missing. Patrick Beverly is probably the guy begging the drum and be like, we need to play out to the stadium that we have always played. To his credit, yeah, he's 35, but he's playing very well. Like, I thought last year was kind of maybe the end of the line for him, especially with all the Lakers stuff that was going on, and then he gets, you know, shipped off to Chicago. But he's really found something with the Sixers this year. Under Doc, he played probably the best he's really played on both ends of the floor when he was with the Clippers. I see the move. I... I can understand why people would be underwhelmed or it's not a needle mover. I do agree with what Adam has said largely with like, we know that the solution to the Bucks fixing or finding whatever they have been lacking doesn't, it's not, doesn't fall on Patrick Beverly's shoulders. It, it revolves around the two constants of Dame Giannis go on down the line between Brooke, Chris being healthy, you know, all the same things that we've been talking about for months and really years now in some cases. Um I I that's where I am kind of at. They they can I understand the vision of if they if they really wanted to go bold and be drastic and look for bigger fish and kind of break up the Bobby Portis, Pat Connaughton, you know, trying to get rid of the core or try to get rid of the pieces without getting into the core four. I under I would have understood that. But I also would have thought that would also be desperate just because you're searching for something, maybe just see what, how things will work, how things will go with a new coach that has five games and just coached one of the worst road trips that they have felt or that they've had all season long. So like, I think at this point for the Bucks to kind of just like, okay, let's just get through. Let's have the waters cool a little bit. Let's see what we have. And then kind of move on and see what how Pat Bev can kind of shape this team in a very, you know, on the on the court and off the court way. I think that is a, a very realistic and even if it's not inspiring to some, I understand the ultimate kind of what they're going for here. Yeah, I think I think there's there's one way to there's multiple ways to look at this. Obviously, I, first of all, I agree with what you guys have said, Adam and Jordan. It's 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 an underwhelming trade deadline if you like if you've watched this team because you see all the layering issues that they have had and even with a new coach again it's still an adjustment period who knows what this team is actually going to look like it it's not going to be substantially like monumentally different 
But you can see that this team has had issues with this bench unit with with two players who are just constantly in trade rumors and Bobby Portis and Pat Connaughton, one because of their play, two because of their salaries. I assume at least one of them was gone. I would have I I was shocked. I've I've talked to Ty so much about this that I couldn't even put a task to what I would do if they didn't if neither of them got traded. I know. Luckily, I didn't because neither of them got traded. It didn't end up working like that. Like the Pat Bev trade. It's a minor move. It's an upgrade. You get you get a, a pl- like an upgrade in defense. And again, he's not the same guy he was. He's not even close to the same guy he was. Is he better than campaign? Is he better than like what the bar is for the Milwaukee Bucks in terms of their backcourt defense? Yeah, the bar is so low there that yes, Patch Beverly is an upgrade. It's just not as monumental or as big of an upgrade as you would have wanted to see, uh, considering the aspirations that this team has. And we'll talk about it in a little bit down the line here. But there's there's options for the bio market, but what this team is like. Um, but yeah, pretty pretty underwhelming considering the stakes about this team this this season and what they had to trade. You see a lot of these guys um, who do get traded, and you're like, hey, could the Bucks have snuck in here and get this for uh, like for example, one one player, Royce O'Neal, going to the Phoenix Suns. They did not have probably enough capital to get that done. It I think they could have gotten him if they really, really wanted him. If but they I think, really, really wanted I think want... you, you're going into Ajax, Marjan. That, which that's what I mean. I think that was the move where I, I saw, and that was maybe like, it was like noon, a little after 12. And, I, and so you're under two hours. And I'm looking at that, I'm like, who are they going to get? Like, I didn't, I didn't see anybody that I could feel like they really felt like they were going to be close to do a deal when he exactly. Royce O'Neal went for three second round picks second round picks exactly. don't mean anything but still like and for Phoenix's perspective but that was cre- I was like that's I wonder if some of the Phoenix cost was actually getting off all the players they got off to that's also part of they it. They had to and send out four players to make that trade because all remember they were like getting A plus off season grades because of all I these great vet minimums, that, and the, they got rid of all of them. They're like, yeah, these guys actually suck. Uh, on though the the Ajax and Marjan, I know how I feel about those guys and the idea of them as prospects, and they're more valuable to me. I don't know if they are more valuable to Doc Rivers, who is now your coach and is going to be your coach next season, than Royce O'Neal is. So. I, I don't know if I fully my my preference would be to keep those guys and I think that's a better version of your team, but you've hired Doc Rivers as your coach, and I think both in the now and mapping further down the road, I think he is more likely to be inclined to use and maybe get the best use out of someone like Royce O'Neill, where he's currently at. Like that that's kind of and maybe a lot of that is some of the challenge of the timing of all of this and Doc is just in and they've had a really tough trip to start with and you're not getting great vibes on court. But then it's also, this is not an interim coach as we talked about in a few different ways. This is your coach. I believe quite a lot still in Marjan and Ajax, but it remains to be seen just how they're going to factor in the rest of this season and beyond and where Doc really is going to come down on that. Where I do think someone who's a bit more experienced and more proven, like there's there's no doubt on that. That's part of why not only is it a more experienced player in Patrick Beverly. That's Sophie, if anyone can hear in the bet. <laughs> Sophie, nothing bad is happening. My <laughs> wife just got home and she's very excited. That's it. Just clear that up. Apologies she's just, for the background she's, noise. She's updating on the trade. That's yeah, all. Yeah, just she just she just spread found out. the word. I do think that is gonna be probably the Maybe the biggest question from here going forward is, will the young guys get any burn? Because I think that is, unless Pat and Bobby can just turn back the clock, which hopefully I, I have more optimism for Bobby, especially if they were to find a big man and maybe play him as the four more, because we've just seen the way they like to defend. Now, again, he's just not well suited to guarding the five. I mean, frankly, it, and I don't think he's really well suited to guarding big wings either, but I think it's more palatable. Yep. Um, but... You know, will Pat be locked into 20 minutes per game for the rest of the season? Or will Marjan or Andre Jackson or AJ Green, who's been the one who has actually gotten burn over him and I think actually has been a better defender all year long than Pat. And I think it's notable, like AJ played more than Pat did in their last game. I, I, that's not nothing. Like that's one of the young guys. I know people want to see the others as well. I do too. I think we're recording before the Wolves game. That, that'll be a big kind of test case because 
Sounds like Jay Crowder and Dame are actually just questionable for that game. A funny aside, Doc Rivers, when asked about Jay, who is marked as probable, said he's extremely questionable. We have a status for that. It's called questionable. Uh, I guess we're back to the same old bucks with the injury designations. But yeah, well, those guys get burned. Like if if the vets continue to not earn it, are they going to get run? Like we know Pat Bev will play. I think that's fine. Like he probably eats into some wing minutes too. I think part of the upside with him over Payne is you feel a lot better about him next to Dame in lineups than you did about campaign, which they certainly tried that at points. I think Griffin more than Doc, and it did not work all that well. Actually, a couple of games it just it did, but it felt you know not sustainable that it did. Um, but I think like the minutes for everyone going forward are going to be a fascinating thing. And I know there's a lot of people listening who you know, Doc won't play the young guys. It's cooked. AJ Green's earned a spot, and I think Marjan or Ajax getting a chance to is going to be really big for the rest of the season, just with the group that they have now and needing to find enough minutes at the wing pending you know that roster spot bringing in a real contributor, which is probably, un- especially with the buyout restriction, is probably unlikely. And actually, real quick, it's a first apron thing, the MLE buyout restriction. I have probably typed and sent this out on Twitter 45 times today. It, if they duck under the second apron or not, which I don't think they have because of Chris's unlikely bonuses, that's a whole mm-hmm. different story. It doesn't matter. They cannot sign someone who was bought out who made more than 12.4 or 12.6 or whatever million dollars, which means no Kyle Lowry, uh, no Marcus Morris, no Spencer Dinwiddie. Spencer Dinwiddie. Also, like, that's fine. Like, those players are bad. Like, there's a reason. I mean, it's not not very enticing. Um, I'll see Spencer Dinwiddie for content purposes. I would have got a kick out of that uh, for all the things that we'd said it was Spencer Dinwiddie. We could have gotten a Galaxy sponsorship on the podcast. I was going to say, is that, is that, is that worth that? anything? I don't even know what the hell that is. <laughs> I don't know if anyone did, Jordan. That's no. fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can. No more free pub Pat. for Spencer Din expletive can I pose a question? Um, has the books bench actually got better with this, or have they just gained more flexibility to maybe have a more idealized, this is not necessarily just starting a lineup, but what could be their best lineup or some combination of that? Basically, where I'm going with this is if Malik Beasley is still the starter, I don't really know to what extent Uh, obviously everyone has to be healthy for all this irrelevant too and chris is a factor in that at the moment um i don't know to what extent they have improved here one of the things with beverly this season is he is his three-point shooting numbers are not great and they're down on where they had been in the doc rivers years of his career i don't know does doc have some magic that he can he could get that going again if he's like the shot whisperer for for he Patrick needs to Beverly. Hear those gravelly tones to knock him down. <laughs> Maybe that's it. But I I do considering again the scale of the bench being the problem and how we feel like it's not about their starting five. It's about how they fill out forty eight minutes and finding rotations that work within that because of the deficiency to the bench. If Patrick Beverly is coming off the bench, I, I think it's tough. Maybe it gives you a backcourt option where you've you've got a strong defender to pair with Dame, but that is also as a very small backcourt. Like I don't I don't think that's necessarily all that straightforward either. I I think the the instinct to be like, oh, that's bolstering your bench, that's an upgrade over campaign. I think it is in a fit sense. I do think campaign has probably been very badly served by the Dame trade in some ways, as in the situation just changed on him, and all of a sudden he found himself in some of these backcourt pairings that didn't work, and it's all kind of turned in one direction. But I, I just, I'm not seeing it as a simple, oh, the bench is better now. It might give them a path to being a bit more experimental and finding patterns that work better. Is everyone else kind of with that, or does anyone just think, no, the bench is straight better? I am with you 100%. I, I think Ty, you were talking about this, you know, pre pod, like well before it, just like after the deadline. It's like they had two, if you're, you know, looking at a scale, it was so lopsided at one end of the floor where we look at Bobby, you look at campaign when he would, when he was in the rotation, obviously he was out of it for, you know, probably a few weeks there. Pat's kind of a neutral, like offensive value defensive value he's just kind of plug and play and 
hope for the best in his minutes. It, it everything was so tilted towards the offense being, you know, working at all cylinders, and we knew where all the you know athletic physical limitations. Obviously, the kind of uh, scale that we're grading on this team now has completely changed with Griffin not being there anymore and you know going after Doc. But just the roster makeup of the Bucks this year and the fact that yeah Jay missed so much time that you you know they learned to play without him but now you're incorporating him back in there. And there was just so there's just a lot to be asked of of him of these kind of defensive minded players to ease up for Chris, ease up on Dame to kind of save their legs. Even Giannis, obviously, as great as I think he's playing defensively this year. There's just, there there wasn't enough. I think it's not, I don't think it's enough to really tilt the scales, you know, long-term in the East or anything like that. But just getting someone like Pat Bev, like, who can guard the best perimeter player Despite being 6'2", it could be someone like Jalen Brunson, it could be Tyrese Halburn, it could be either Darius Garland or Donovan Mitchell if you're playing those those types of teams that I'm thinking about come playoff time. That eases up, even if it's, to Adam's point, that is a very small backcourt if you're going to look at Dame and Pat possibly starting in or playing heavy minutes together in a playoff series. But I just think it kind of, realigns the order of how they can kind of find something that's working because obviously for all the great you know for all the things that Bobby brings and everything like that there there there's still this thing about the bench and and anytime the Bucks have like we felt like they've been really deep that you can go nine ten players they just fall on their face come playoff time. It's never what, worked What out is that, that? It's literally, it's the deeper they get on paper, the just more lifeless even the then bench is being. Like to a... I, so I, it's deep on paper. I think I, be, they're I, not. <laughs> well, I think Doc's emphasis on refining what Dame and Giannis do is going to be important here because, you know, you just need, you just need to be more complimentary and more focused on your key players. And that gets harder with Chris out. And I think Bobby's just got to, I would. I think he's been setting some more screens. I think they need to move him even farther in that direction when he's out there with Dame, and, and just you know involve those other guys, involve the primary guys in actions more, even if they're not doing all the work. I mean, we've seen Doc go pretty thin with the rotation with all these injuries, but I imagine when they're healthy, let's we'll say pre playoffs, because we just need to see how all of this works together now. But it'll probably be the starters, and I assume Patrick Beverly does not start for the Bucks. I mean, maybe. Eventually, that changes. I think Beasley is still pretty entrenched. I think it would have taken a, a bit a higher caliber of player. You know, again, prime Patrick Beverly for sure comes in and starts. I think at this point in his career, he is their backup point guard who can do a little more than that. But I think it's the starters. I think Pat Bev plays. Obviously, I think Bobby Portis plays. You know, at this point, there is no other big literally now with Robin Lopez gone. Uh, and then I would imagine Jay Crowder, who has continued to play a lot of minutes, plays. So I do think you have two pretty good defenders there. And as you said, Jordan, uh, one much better option for the guards in the East, where you look at the top teams in the Eastern Conference, there's a small guard to guard on all of them. I mean, even the Celtics, who, of course, the Jays are a big problem, you know, still you need someone to guard Derek White. And Drew Holiday is there, although he's, you know, their team is just so good, he kind of has to be an afterthought. And uh, even one of the Jays, you know, you don't have too many wings to guard both of them. So I think... That's nice. I think your, your bench is certainly bringing a lot of more defense now to the team. But I think it's going to be those three and then probably one of, like Pat or one of the young guys, is probably going to be their normal rotation, right? Like I don't think they're going to go too much deeper than nine. Maybe they will. But who wins that spot I think is going to be really important um, going forward and this season and going forward. Um, and yeah, I'm really not sure who it's going to be. Like I said, right now, A.J. Green has pole position, which – I just never, never would have expected. No, no slight to AJ Green, but on a team where you look at it and go, oh, they need more athletes, they need more defense, uh, and that's the thing. That's why, especially having a Marjan or Ajax, not just another good player, but just more athleticism, because you certainly did not gain a whole lot of that by getting thirty-five-year-old Patrick Beverly for all the things he does. Uh, I really hope we get to see one of those two. I, I did not think Marjan was going to make the deadline. It just seemed like getting no burn at this point. It, it felt un- like like just why. 
but I, I still believe in him as a player. It's not because I was out on him. So yeah, it'll be it'll be really interesting to see just how that the end of the rotation goes. Because I think there are probably eight spots that to me are pretty firm right now, and then just a whole lot of who knows after that. Ajax is hot to minutes may not have improved if Patrick Beverly is going to play a lot of minutes too. Just probably in terms not. of fit, in terms of the, the offensive issues that are yeah likely going to be there. So where in a lot of ways, like he's my answer of like who I want. And that's kind of, I, I just, things have changed and, and they may not have to like AJ green may actually have an even stronger in now than what he had already established. So I guess I'd probably lean there or pot will probably being the vet, he will get some chances. And if he did find something, he could probably earn it back very, very quickly, arguably too quickly. Yeah. But, I'm probably he'll, saying it's AJ Green or Pat. He'll definitely have chances in these next couple of weeks when we know they'll be without Chris Middleton and there's some other injury stuff. And of course, the trade for these next two games. I believe Pat Bev broke on his weird live podcast that he would not play until Monday's game against Denver. Um, the trade is still not official. So Doc Rivers had to talk about adding a hypothetical point of attack defender at the deadline, which is pretty funny. He did say, quote, instigator would be an understatement when talking about a hypothetical player which I find hilarious. Uh, Rohan, what are your thoughts about how the Bucks rotation comes together and how Pat Bev impacts the bench? My first thought is like when, when I heard this trade go through, I was like, oh, immediately, like he's not going to start. Pat Bev's not going to start. What sort of rotational role can he fill? What lineups would he help? And my first thought was, oh, he's going to help the, the Dame lineups with no Giannis on the court. And then I started actually looking at the data as you guys have been talking. And that's just not true because they don't really play like that. My thought was they were going to, there was going to be more of a sample with Damian Lillard and Cameron Payne in the lineup together. And they're going to be like a poor defensive team could bring that up. Use that. No, I was proven wrong. Actually, the most used Dame non Giannis lineup this season has been Dame Malik. Oh, no. Yeah. Dame uh, Malik Beasley, Bobby Portis, Pat and Rook. And uh, it's just it's only been like 59 minutes this season, but it's it's just it, it's a weird combination of uh, <laughs> of players. But now that I actually look at this, I don't really like know where this is going to fit in. If you want to look at the Giannis non Dame lineups, maybe you could fit him in there because those those lineups have had very, very poor defensive ratings. For example, the most used lineup with Giannis and uh no Damian Lillard is Chris, Giannis, Campaign, Bobby, and Pat. Uh, can you guess what the defensive rating for that lineup is? 126. Like, I was going to say 125. Adam? Say 126. I was going to say 128, honestly, because I don't think it's impossible that it could be real. 128.1. Wow. Look at that. Oh. So bad, very bad. Yeah, holy yeah. <laughs> And you yeah, go down Lord. the list and you just see these Giannis uh, campaign lineups just getting destroyed. So maybe there is uh, where it's actually going to be most fruitful because we think, oh, uh, Patrick Beverly helps out when, you know, that he's a, a backcourt made for Dame out there. How are those lineups really going to factor in? But maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's when Dame isn't on the court and he can be there to help support Giannis, like a point of attack defender. Uh, along with Giannis, just uh, either at the four or the five, just playing like uh, help defense or just traditional like center defense, whatever you want it, whatever you want to say, whatever machinations you can find. I think he might actually fit in more there because it's clear the help is most needed over there. Uh, I think the other thing that's worth mentioning in that, that kind of it may not be immediately apparent on first stop. I think anyone who's been watching the books this season will certainly get to it pretty quickly. A big knock-on effect of that, and we're talking defensively, is it's now, well, the the gaping hole in the roster where a backup big would be. You know, and the the impact that... It's time. Okay. If Be- well, we'll get to that, Ty. We'll get to that. If Beverly does come in and is a successful, competent point-of-attack defender and restores a little bit of something that has been lost, obviously, with Drew Holiday's departure... Brooke can certainly benefit from that too. He may have to contest a few less shots, maybe have his positioning be a little bit better. Giannis, that can certainly be a factor for him as well. 
but the wild card in that mix, and I think in in you trying to map out Rohan where he'll fit in and what kind of rotations is probably what ultimately ends up of the backup big. Because, for example, if Bobby Portis is going to have to continue to do a lot of that, you might want Patrick Beverly out there in Bobby Portis minutes to just try and limit what's going to get true and what's going to get going downhill. And as much as our instinct is to think about where in the Giannis and Dame of it all is going to fit in, it might just be the necessity of if Bobby is going to have to take the majority of your backup big minutes still, that might be where where Beverly is needed most to try and shore up the, the defensive bench units. Let's because we haven't yet uh, just Beverly's numbers on the season. So the per game stuff is obviously never going to be overwhelming for a player like this, and certainly not at this point in his career. But in nineteen point six minutes per game, which is actually down quite a bit from last season, and I I wouldn't be surprised if that climbed on Milwaukee, given that he's the guy they went out and got, and I think there is certainly a need for. You know, more defenders coming off the bench. But he's averaging 6.3 points, shooting 43% from the field. The three-point percentage is down. It has been down for about three years now, but he's at 32% this season. The two-point percentage is actually above 52% for the second straight season. He doesn't take a lot of shots in total, but he has finished inside the arc pretty well. 3.1 rebounds, 3.1 assists, uh, half a steal, just about half a block, and then one turnover. So, you know, three to one turnover rate ratio here, assist turnover, I should say. So still, like, he is a backup point guard, too. I mean, of course, all the emphasis is on what he does defensively, but he handles the ball well and distributes well and can set up the offense in a way that, I mean, I think campaign certainly is a better shooter at this point, And when he was on, is certainly a better scorer. But there might be value, too, in just having someone who sets the table more and shoots less on this team where there is a lot of offensive talent, like can... Bobby Portis and Malik Beasley get some better looks maybe with 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 Dame not out there. And obviously Giannis is distributed very, very well too. But that will be interesting to track as well uh, with Beverly. Should we uh, talk about the other potential additions now that the Bucks do have a roster spot after trading good old Robin Lopez? We'll do do, your, do your thing. Come on, Ty. Me give us, first? Give us, yeah, go. Let's, let's get it over with. Well, I mean, I'm not even going to – everyone knows. Everyone's listened. I won't go deep. I, his Mac Biombo makes a lot of sense. A real five. Play Bobby at the four some more. Moves Mambo pretty well. I think he's, think he's useful. I also think Rohan, our guy Marquise Chris, maybe give him a look. I mean, he's playing very well with the herd. He was a pretty good, I thought, backup center in his time with Golden State and then had the really devastating knee injury with Dallas. But he's moved well with the herd and – I mean, they went out and acquired him and brought him in. Obviously, you always want more good players on the G League. It's not like they wouldn't wouldn't have just wanted to do that anyway at that level. But, I mean, they already had a couple of skilled big men there, Marquise Bolden and Wenyan Gabriel, who is out hurt right now after a nasty fall over the weekend. So I'm not sure what his timetable is like. It's really unfortunate timing for him because he's having a great season too. Um, but I I think still think Biz would make a lot of sense. I mean, I think less sense now that, you know, Bobby is still on the roster. It's not like they desperately need a big to play big minutes anymore. But I think out of the available players, they can legally sign. He's close to the top of my list right now. But I'm loving the uh, 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 Rohan teased one before the episode. I don't even know who. Uh, so Rohan, who is your? You said they have no. no win. Come back to me. Come back to me. I'm trying to find something. Oh, okay. Who hmm. else has a player? Hopefully, someone else has a player. Adam doesn't know who's available yet. Uh, I've been scrolling like for about ten minutes. And I have not historically been on board with, you know, your your biz agenda. Yeah. Um, and then you look at these names. The, all these guys are terrible. The, Glenn, all these Glenn Robinson the third maybe is high on the list too. Uh, Another herd player. Hey, uh, this is. No, I, I don't. He's got I don't want to be positive attitude. I don't want to be disrespectful, right? When, disrespectful. You, when you said Mark, when you said Mark, he's Chris. I don't want to be disrespectful. This is a team that. We came into this season with championship expectations or bust, and it, we're talking about guys. It's the same way I feel. Like I like AJ Green. I think AJ Green is good, but we're talking about AJ Green winning out. I like. I find it so difficult to just kind of maintain any level of pretense that this is not feeling like a lost season. They oh, can't I, I carry disagree. on like that. They've, got, they've got to go. All the they've time, got to... and the Bucks are actually overdue in finding good contributors on minimums and through development like that. I just, they never try it. 
so much so that it's like well, now you're trying, right. You're saying this AJ is... Green is a joke. No, no, we're. I'm I'm just saying it's a problem when AJ Green is the solution at this point because that is very far from how you drew it up, and I'm not I'm fine with AJ Green being the guy. It's if let's say I don't like using him as the example because he's just a name we threw out. But if Marquis Chris then becomes the big, it's like all right, it would be a great time to like become the Miami Heat in terms of plucking guys from the G League system and having it just work. I don't have a lot of faith in that being something that's just going to start working for the books because the books have not done a good job or shown much interest in it. They can change. If they change, look, and if that works out, I'll eat my words. I just, I think it's really, really tough for this team and for everything that's needed. Um, So much so even that you said earlier, like this can't, Pat Bev is in an unfortunate position where he is the only acquisition to this point, you know. So even though we can't hang everything on him, people are naturally going to look for him to have an outsized contribution, even if that's subconscious, even if that's illogical, where the book's problems at the moment just run deeper than that. And I think part of the, the biggest problem is I don't feel like internally everyone feels like they know what's wrong, right? And maybe that's one of the things that the fact there hasn't been an immediate, you know, Griff is gone and there's this bump of a new coach is in. That would have been the real easy way where everyone just started to feel good and everything looked right. And the schedule has not helped them on that front. But I, I do think there are so many problems. And I think maybe the biggest problem they have is I don't feel like, for example, I don't feel like guys like Giannis, Chris, Brooke, Dame, they necessarily can pinpoint and just be like, it's just this thing that we know we do, and if we get that right, we're going to win. In this current incarnation, in like the Dame Lillard books era, they've never really got to that point, so I don't feel like they have that. So, I I just, it's tough. Like, these names on the buyout list, I'm scrolling, they're awful. There is not, there's not the kind of solution we want, and that's fine, That's there's nothing you can do about that at that point. I just, I think it becomes really, really tough. It doesn't mean, like, they might as well have a flyer on some of these guys. I just think it, it's a real representation of where we've come. And I I think we got to start talking about this season in a different way and hope we're really, really pleasantly surprised if that is going to be the path that the last roster spot would be filled out with and where we're going to look from these contributions. Because it's just night and day from where we were when Dame became a book. And where all our expectations are and everything around that. Like, I know I'm saying the obvious and so much has happened since then. But I, it really is like, it's a it's a shock to the system. There's an element of whiplash to go from that kind of conversation to the kind of conversations we're having now when the books are so actively behind the, the place we would have wanted them to be at this point in the season. To then be like, well, this might be how they're going to kind of bridge to the, the end of the season. It's just, it's tough. Okay, so no names from Adam. Jordan, do you have anyone that uh, you're interested in with the last roster spot? Uh, I'm also looking at um, buyout players. I think the obvious one that many have already talked about that for right now seems to not be a scenario is P.J. Tucker, just because, you know, we love a good reunion and everything like that. Seems like he's not even going to be dealt with why unless, why would you what, here, here, what's, what's 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 the logic between a reunion with pj tucker i'm just saying that is what people no i'm I'm not i'm not saying it in a negative light i'm just asking it sounded pretty aggressive no <laughs> no no, you aggressive. Know, no you'll you'll, Rohan, you'll understand. Rohan, put your finger down Stop no you'll understand <laughs> you'll understand so the logic behind a pj tucker edition is oh, one he's he, doing a bit oh yeah oh, okay oh, he, uh, you quick, were supposed PJ's... to set him up PJ's very mad. He's not getting bought out. He's not going to give up the next guaranteed year, and the Clippers aren't going to give it to him. So he's just got to stay there and post angrily. Go ahead, Rohan. So the logic, I, first of all, let, let me address this. You guys just assume that I'm upset when I'm trying to do like a trying to do a segue. It might be your tone of voice behind a PJ Tucker acquisition. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. So. It, it's because he's a he's a like a, a big guy. He's a defensive minded guy who's going to be like a tweener forward to really unlock like small ball Giannis at the five lineups. Be a guy who would just be a malleable defender. 
And what if I told you you can get P.J. Tucker at home in a guy who has not who has played in his most used lineups, uh, been the biggest guy out on the floor for a weird team? I'm talking about Thaddeus Johnson. Thaddeus Young. Thaddeus Young. Uh-huh. Thaddeus Young is eligible eligible to be signed by the Bucks because he was waived uh, by the Brooklyn Nets as part of the Dennis Schroeder, Spencer Dinwiddie trade. He's only making eight million, so he's below the mid level exception, which means the Bucks are eligible to sign him. And like I mentioned, he was playing for a weird Toronto Raptors team where he had to play a lot of small ball five. You don't need him to do that, but he is a guy. He is a six eight big dude who's not. He's not like a defensive stopper. He's not that guy. He's not that guy. I'm not going to lie and say, yeah, he's the solution to everything. No, but he is a guy who could come in, be sort of a lineup, like a versatile lineup, flexible guy like we thought Jay Crowder could be. He'd be better at that than Jay Crowder. He'd be a guy who you can throw out there and say, hey, we want to play Giannis at the five. Can you go be a four? Can you go chase guys around screens too? Can you be a switchable four? Yes, Thaddeus Young can go and do that. And he's available. He's a very good system defender, yeah. uh, I think would be a way I'd put it, as opposed to someone being more of an individual defender. I I will say, because Ty just said, you know, oh, I'm not going to give any name. I was going to endorse Ty, oh. which would have been a, like a big turn up for the books. I think you've probably come out with the best name that is out there. I, I do like Ty Young, but I'm, gonna, I'm still going to stick with Ty, just because I think they need a real big. And I, I know Ty Young could play oh, there, the but height. I... I do, have a, I do have a stat. This is for not Thad. very tall. I think I think they are the same height. This is. That young is like six eight. Yeah, so is and Biz. Biz is just Biz heavier. Six eight. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I do. Really? I do have a stat for Thad Young. Okay. Uh, players with eight hundred <laughs> games oh, boy, to average. It up. <laughs> to average thirteen and a half points, five point nine rebounds, one point four steals, forty nine percent shooting from the field. And 30% from three, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and yes, of course, Thaddeus Young. A brief four years ago, he was 14th in the sixth man of the year voting. He has played a lot more this year than I had thought, just because the Raptors have been really bad. Granted, it's only been 350 350 minutes, but that is more than I thought he had played. (laughs) 2.2 assists per game. He moves the ball. Yeah, that'd be fine. Him or him or Biz would be like the best actual true veterans that are available, unless you count Chris. I, I have I'd have to look through like who else is a lot of former NBA guys who are playing in the G League. There could be someone there, and if someone like that, you could do a ten day and get a trial period. I was gonna say it's like because of where the Bucks are at, the Evan Fournier's, Spencer Dinwiddie's, the names that we've already mentioned, those are off limits. Yeah. Do you look at? Do you look at? I'm not endorsing this. Just throw it out there. Do you look at like Killian Hayes? These guys, there were two lottery picks waived today. I'm not saying sign James Booknight. Is that yeah, Booknight? Well, certainly don't say it. I'm yeah, not saying. No, I'm not. I'm not looking at that. But I'm just. I, I, but the thing is, is like there is to the overall point. None of these guys are really gonna move the needle like we're or even i don't think they're even gonna really play that much probably the the, the one buyout guy that really probably makes a, a considerable considerable impact that that bucks obviously are off limits from signing is kyle lowry if he does indeed go to philadelphia which i think and is that, actually really good. and it's like and even if they were at that point it's like how many more like small guards do you need Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I feel it, fine about Pat Bev versus Kyle Lowry. They couldn't sign him anyway, Same. but I, I feel like I'm happy with the guy. Like, the that's got. not that's not really adding to your. It's not helping you. It, it, like yeah. your issues, that you're glaring holes. Billy, you mean? Are you no, about Philly saying, or, or no, for the if books, the books were also. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. I don't even know if it does that much for Philly, frankly, but he's from there, and I guess they're real excited about it. Whatever. And Maury. Yeah. True. Nurse too. Oh yeah, yeah, that's fair. I don't know, my guys, my guys, my guys, Thadjik Johnson. That's a good one. I'd be happy with him or Biz or just like give someone a ten day. I'm and... surprised he's getting waived. Who, Thad? Who? Yeah. Well, he got traded to Brooklyn. Yeah. Did he? Used to, he played there for a while. Didn't he, he did he? play sure there. Uh, well. Played there when Marks actually at the 
right before Marcus got the job, I think. It was for one like year. half a season. It was one year, yeah. Or two? No, it was two. It was one and a half seasons. I wonder if uh, maybe they're just going to play some of their young guys some more. They're having a really. That's a weird season. They don't have their pick. It's but a they really suck. weird year. They had all these. Oh, vets Dorian and they finished just Smith's trade. No. No, see, Not I don't surprised. think the Bucks could have gotten him. I think they they could have gotten Royce. Yeah, I I meant to bring this up when we were talking about Royce O'Neal earlier, but since Royce O'Neal went for like three seconds, there's no shot that the Bucks could have mm-hmm. had any chance to get Dorian Finney Smith because he has a higher value. Unless the Nets really liked one of Marjan or Andre Jackson Jr. You never know yes. with that stuff. I you, I assume probably sure. not because I already have a bunch of you know youngish players who are not helping them all that much, but maybe. Um, yeah, I think – honestly, I'll say this though. Like I wouldn't have been blown away if they just got Royce O'Neal either. Like I think you could Same. argue that's, yeah. like getting Pat Oh, Bev, for sure. Getting that, Pat that doesn't Bev solve anything either. Like, so giving up campaign and the worst second to get Pat Bev, probably a better move than going all out. And Marjan and Pat and both seconds to get Royce O'Neal. Like I think Royce probably helps you a little more this season. I don't – think it's that important of a difference to justify the cost? I'm not giving I, up on the year. I, I know no one on this podcast is. Like, I think they could still win it all this year if they figure everything out. I think they've won a lot of games without really getting rolling at any point. I know their offensive rating is great, but Dame has not played like Dame for a sustained period. I really think he will. I think we're going to get there. We just haven't yet. Uh, hopefully some more stability for the rest of the year will help, which it would be hard for them to be less stable than they've been thus far. Um but I, I just – I don't think – like I, if we were sitting here and it was like, wow, they gave up you know, one of their few young core players they've had in this whole era who's shown any glimpses, all of their draft capital they could trade and Pat, who's you know, – at this point, that's not a real consideration. And got Royce O'Neal. I think we'd all kind of have mostly the same reaction and maybe the yes. expectations would be even higher on him because now you don't have a Marjan to like hope for for this year and going forward either. I don't think their team is necessarily broken as much as they need to get the best versions of all the guys in the team. And all of a sudden, this is a title contender again. Or at again. least most of them. Most of them. But for three, example, if we want to kind of lay it out, I would say, first and foremost, Dame has to become the guy that you, you thought you were getting when you traded for him. Probably second and... Importance for me, Chris needs to be healthy. <laughs> Chris needs to be healthy and needs to be comfortable. And, you know, if Dame starts playing great, like Chris still has his place out there and that all feels like it's working. And then if we want to say three or four, you're getting into Bobby Portis, Pat Connaughton territory. I think you can simplify like, just three bench players, really figure it out, and you feel really good about it. I think three gets you there through the playoffs. I mean, you need more contributions than that than a regular season. But if you have three bench players where you're like, we can rely on these three guys to come in and you know at least keep us afloat and make sure the starters aren't doing everything, I think you're probably in a good enough – four would be great. But, I mean, we know – you're, you're right. You're not playing – I think. Not nine guys in most playoff late series playoff the, games. The only thing I'll add to that is those three guys then have to include Bobby Portis because he's he's your only other until Big Biz moment. or Thad Johnson or Marquise Chris or Wenyan Gabriel pulls up. I threw in a couple where, of names just to where disrupt. are all the bigs? It's just no one no one wants to part with bigs. I'm I'm going through we, every we could get more every aggregated still. list and Robin hear, Lopez Robin is Lopez so Lopez high is up on all of these. Yeah. He's can't. so high up on all buyout lists. That's true. Ty, Ty, it's it's a joke. Could you imagine if they did? <laughs> It'd be well. You can't like you you mentioned, but it would be funny. It would be less embarrassing than the coach switch. At least we were wrong. <laughs> Rolo, Rolo, getting George Hill is actually tough, tough they would beat. they would get the Portland pick taken away because that's that's cap circumvention and it would cut their luxury tax bill to do it. So that's why you can't do that. Yep, it does cut uh, their tax bill. It's the it's the Elgoskis rule, right? I don't yes. know if that rule's named after. Is it? Is that rule named after it, someone? He's like this. Uh, probably the most recent example of like uh, you can't. That. Yeah, I don't know if it's like I don't know if it's like officially like an El Goskis rule, but it's like I think it was because of him. The yeah, Drunas. this is a bad luck. Tis, tisk the Drunas. <laughs> no, I, I Adam brought up a good point of like just the young guys like 
between AJ Green, Marjan, Ajax. I mean, not to crap on AJ Green because he's been having a good run of form, but the guys that really excite me are Marjan and Andre Jackson Jr. When we talk about this team being the life cycle that they are, and you know they're getting older, these injuries that specifically Chris is going through, like it's not they're not career ending injuries, but they happen when you have accumulated enough miles and minutes that you just like okay spray your it, uh, 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 a freak kind of just turn your ankle you might be out for a couple minutes or a couple minutes a couple games those kinds of things just pile up and you want to see this team be young and start to kind of show more athleticism versatility all that stuff i've come to the conclusion and and this is not a doc exclusive problem because it's already something that we've talked about plenty. It was something that as much as I love Mike Budenholz or what he's given, gave the bucks and everything like that, it was a problem for him too, but it's also just the bucks thing of what they have done for the last five years is that like when you don't have that kind of development pipeline and you, any type of moves that you made that, to consolidate picks, to consolidate for assets, or kind of just try to find, you know, gems here and there. And that doesn't come as much as, like, other teams have been able to do it when they're contending. It's very hard. It's it's a really hard way to do it when you're picking at the bottom of every round. And I mean, they've spent, they what, two? They've used on the, on players they kept two firsts since 2018, 2019? Yep. Dante, Dante and Marjan. Marjan. I mean, that's, that kind of sums it up. It's really hard to consistently develop players that aren't picked in the top 30. Yep. And I just think, like, I'm excited for what they can bring to the Bucks, but, like, I think we're at the point where we just don't – I don't really have attachment to these players. What they what they serve to the Bucks could, could be as impactful to them in a trade than what they do actually on the court. Like, that is where we're at, and it's – kind of just like a very black and white thing. And it, as much as I like trying to find the humanity of like, this guy's really figuring it out. Like you like to see that over the course of an 82 game season and stuff like that. But where they're at, like I, all the reports of like, I think it was Jake Fisher that was kind of most prominent on it, where they're already including Marjan Bochamp in trade talks. And I'm just thinking like, they had like a freaking parade in the arena when he got drafted. And they're like, <laughs> they show all the off like people that work for the Bucks are like, here's Marjan. This is our big, you know, first round pick in like four years. And it's like, we're already shopping. You know what I mean? Like that's it just shows I, you just that's like a how- desperation move though, too. And they, they are in a slightly desperate spot in trying to save this season and trying to propel something more positive going into next season. Like it it may be some reflection on Marjan, but I also think some on it may not too. be as some on Doc, and it just may not Some be as horse. much a reflection on anyone as yeah. as we think. It's just trying to find some way. These are the limited pieces I have to work with, and yeah. we need to do something to salvage this. And I'm not necessarily in favor of that. Like I'm, and I'm glad he's I'm glad he's still there, and hopefully that works out in a different way because the books still really need that with the younger guys. But I. I just I see how they got to that point, even if it's not what they want to do. It's it's just a reflection of this season. Yeah, that's like we could go back further, but it's that's a knock on effect of getting the head coaching hire wrong when you you get Adrian Griffin in as your coach. The team isn't as good, and all of a sudden you have to make something happen. Marjan becomes one of the more expendable players. So, one like of the if, most, if they can, probably. yeah, in terms absolutely. Of young guys. If they if they could steady the ship like and finish this season out well and I don't know I I'd be kind of curious respectively Jordan and I I think talked about this on the last win in six but like what to everyone would represent this season finishing out well at this point for the books um I like is there wiggle room in that or is it just very much we're still looking at well, this is a Giannis and Damian Lillard team and we're on the timeline guys are getting older I don't know but. I'd like to imagine a world where it it finishes out in a positive sense and we can have a refresh and duck gets a full training camp and guys are bought in in a different way and the likes of Marjan and Ajax are 
reinvigorated and continue to develop and they eventually do ascend to a place that the books need them to be whether that's realistic or not the books are just always going to have to be super focused on the now and pushed into these spots where at times it's going to feel desperate but they're always just going to have to make the most pragmatic decision with the present in mind and with the short short term future in mind and that's it makes it a tough place to be a younger player well like it's going to be harder to trade them going forward with the second apron rule on aggregating salaries that may be part of the reason that Marshawn was shopped around because now they pretty much if they're above the second apron they just have to trade him away and get an asset and then try and use that somewhere else which i mean you could do those things in conjunction but it certainly makes it harder than saying okay here's you know, Marjan and Pat, and we'll take your $15 million player who's good. Yeah. I actually think AJ Green's probably in line to continue playing a lot of minutes when you look at this bench. And the other perimeter players, the vets, are very defensive-minded now. Like, I think, Adam, you made this point in opposite about Ajax. Like, Marjan as well, you'd think would be at least earlier in line to play than Ajax just because you're, you're mm-hmm. bringing... Patrick Beverly, Jay Crowder, two very defensive first players off the bench. I think they're going to be very prominent roles. You need more. And Ajax hasn't been horrible offensively, but he's limited offensively. And I don't know if you want to bring three guys who, you know, Crowder can shoot, does shoot, has not made many of them. Pat just Pat Beverly just doesn't shoot very much. And Ajax, we know, will actively turn down shots in a way that is very frustrating. So Marjan doesn't. I think Marjan is a, a pretty good middle ground. I would like to see him get run again. I'd like to see him play against the Timberwolves and Hornets in these next two games. And I think certainly A.J. Green, the role he's already carved out, he's probably going to have a good shot to hold it unless Pat does really come alive with some more post-trade deadline confidence, which could happen. I mean, Doc talked about pretty uh, – It's we're hearing a lot from Doc. It's kind of interesting. But, you know, that his confidence just needs to be there. Maybe not being traded will help with Pat. We'll see. Um, but I think AJ Green is, has made strides there. And again, I'm surprised at anyone. I like AJ a lot. Uh, I think the fact that he's held up defensively, I think, very well in these minutes, even without hitting his shots, is going to keep him at least getting chances until everyone gets healthy. We'll see what happens from there. Yeah, we'll we'll just have to. It's a it's a wait and see sort of game. We'll we'll have to like revisit this in a I don't know a month or so. Yeah, I think we'll it, revisit it very I... often between now and then. Can I bring it back and actually pin you guys down on what the is expectations? If yeah, is what is what is it, like what playoffs, is playoffs? I'm disappointed. Yep. Any round specifically? Well, then it's, it's likely conference finals. I mean, if that's oh, the Bucks are what fourth right now? Or it could be second round. It doesn't matter to me the round. I mean, we did this whole thing with Brooklyn when they almost lost, and then with Boston in the second round. I mean, it's if the standings shake out that is Boston. In the second round, and they, they lose a, a good, they don't get, you know, boat race. They lose a good series to Boston. I'll be, you know, moderately disappointed. If they lose to anyone else outside of just freak injuries or get smoked by Boston, I'll be disappointed in the season. Yeah. I think I'm, I think I'm at the same place considering right. even, even though we know these teams, like the Knicks loaded up, we didn't talk about the Knicks. They got Alec Burks, Boyan Bogdanovich. Uh, sent out this was a lame deadline. I've been defending this deadline. That being loaded up at this deadline is lame. Well, it is. It, it is lame. lame. But here's the thing: they did get better. The Knicks did get better, and they they're a yeah. team who has been playing very, very, very well of late. Yeah. Uh, I again, the Cavs have been surging. Like all these teams, the Sixers. Who knows what's going to go on with them? If they get Kyle Lowry, they just got Buddy healed. That's uh, an, another one of the headline trades of this deadline. Um, they they Pacers got better. Had a weird deadline. Pacers Pacers always have a weird everything. Did they bring in Doug McDermott? Or is that uh, someone else? No, no they, they, they got Dougie McBucket. So again. they just switched they, out one shooter for. Why are loads of teams picks. bringing guys back? Yeah. Doug McDermott was it's a not, Pacer. It's not right? just the Bucks now. It's not just the Bucks. <laughs> hey, Valentine's but, Day is around the corner. They're feeling some longing for their old partners. The Raptors. An ad read. The Raptors did a weird thing. The Raptors did a lot of weird things. Adam, Raptors, have you caught up on all the Raptors trades? I I might have seen some of them, which might have taken the juice out of something to yeah. do with this. Um, They're getting cap space, baby. They're going to be right there. They can bring back DeMar DeRozan. We can bring back the renewals, or the reunions, I mean. They I don't even... Who, 
who do they think they're going to get? I mean, which is always I a think thing, but I, I think they no, think they're, they're going to resign. They're going to resign Kelly Olynyk. They are going to resign. They're for sure going to resign Kelly oh, Olynyk and eat into that Canada. catch first. Canada. Is that so, to keep Kelly fans is, on side? So they're, 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 I they're honestly like, think that's Canadians I, this year. I, I that's what I think that they're leaning into. Between that would be kind of that would be kind of sick. I don't. I'm. They you guys may Shea. not be familiar if with this. If they don't get Shea, it's lame. There, there are some teams. There are some teams in La Liga, in Ligas. Spanish football, soccer, in the Basque country. Ty, I'm not going to get you into the politics of the Basque region. Actually, I'm out of thoughts on this. Uh, well, I'll wait until let's say that for another time. time. Yeah. There are a couple of clubs, and specifically uh, Athletic Club from Bilbao, they only are allowed to sign Basque players, and they compete at a very high level. They're the third most successful club in the history of Spanish football behind Barcelona and Real Madrid. And they can only sign players from the Basque region. Wouldn't it be sick if the Raptors just became? We can only have Canadians. They could also it would entertain me, and that would work. Oh, I, I, there is a path to being good with that, but yeah. there's it's also a, a path, path to bringing Kelly Olynyk in and you know giving him a new deal. This RJ has played well there. Uh, yeah, they also got Oche Akbaji, who has been pretty bad, and they gave up a first round pick to do those things. And they got off second year in a row game. that they gave up a first. They gave up draft capital for for a white center <laughs> whose contract is expiring. <laughs> Two years in a row. That's just crazy. Cr- and they signed the first one. They still have him. It's not like they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sixers. Don't All the Daniel big- House. People are asking, is Daniel House a good? No, he's just bad. He's not good at basketball. What the is that? The bubble is that Schroeder. Oh, dang it, Jordan. I was going to make a bubble <laughs> joke. Yeah, that's, that's the trade I was most excited to tell you about, Adam. So they, they, they opened up cap space. That's what that was. They take back Dinwiddie. They are waiving him. Again, the Bucks are not eligible to sign him. He's also been horrible this season. They give up Dennis Schroeder, who actually I'm like, I think he's had a good, would have been a decent, you know, Bucks guy to get as well, but he's on like $12 million. So it would have been a lot more expensive. And Thad Young. They give up like two real ish players. It would be nice if, that the dad Bucks got Thad Young out of that for free just to get Dinwiddie and then cut him immediately. So now they can sign another probably Wisconsin herd player because they like to do that. Shout out to Joe Wieskamp. That is just one of the weirder trades when I, where I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is so uninteresting. So if I was a fan yeah. of either of those teams, I'm like, this is just grim stuff. And they also they got Dennis to get Smith Jr., about. didn't they? That's not listed yes. on here. Do yeah, that is right. Yeah, they moved him to Toronto. Is that? Did that actually happen? I, I, it got deleted I saw at one point. Did that, that not I, actually happen? No, I don't think it. I think he meant Dennis Schroeder. Oh. Uh, so yes. why did the Nets have? Who, so they, who so was that? Nets, I wonder. Was that? Was the Shams? No, I think it was Woj. Woj. Oh. The, the Nets got rid of Royce O'Neal, but then br- immediately brought in Dennis Schroeder. I guess they got rid of Dinwiddie too. But like, why? Yeah. We just need to stockpile all these defensive-minded vets to finish 11th in the Eastern Conference. Weird team. They're, they're Weird team. As Do something notable. They're trying to find this middle, like, rebuild. The Utah's list of, the same way, but I feel way more confident what Utah is doing than Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. I mean, Utah has all the picks. They got another first-round pick at this deadline. I think it kind of stinks they got worse because they are holding a play-in spot, but it probably won't really matter to this season. How this goes for them. I'm scrolling all these deals. I can't believe you were talking yourself into this deadline, Ty. This is terrible. None of the big... Well, well I, there I'm, I'm going to say... There was a flurry for a while. The Mavs did... I, I don't actually like their deadline all that much, but they were very You got active. the adrenaline. You got the rush, the deadline rush. It's the rush frequency of. that gets you. A lot right. of deals came there through was a rhythm. Like an hour. Yeah. There was a rhythm to like... Okay, it was like the 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock hour. It's like bang, 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 bang. And yeah. then you look at the names of like... Who really moved? And then Boyan, the the Knicks Pistons deal was it was reported in like segments. Yeah, yeah. And first it was Alec I'm, Burks for Quentin Grimes. Everyone was like, "Why would you ever do that?" And then the Boyan part came through. Yeah, and then there was a lunch break. Yep. Of course. And then that's when the Bucks or the flurry of like Royce O'Neal to the Suns, and then. That going into a three teamer with Memphis sending David Roddy. Oh, oh I was gonna, oh, Jordan. You, I was gonna ask Adam to guess the Grizzlies player who went to the Suns. I, I, I'd and, seen it already. I'd well, seen it already. Did you see what Shams referred to him as? No, I didn't. A playoff I, I rotational piece, David uh, Roddy. Also, who's Roddy's agents? 
I'll, I'll look into it. He's a very good one, apparently. Wonder if he Gordon, got any connections to Shams. Let's find out. The Gordon Hayward Oklahoma City Charlotte deal, where Shams just carrying buckets of water said, uh, Trey Mann's going to Charlotte. Uh, a pick, <laughs> the 2021 pick with a, a ton of upside. Yeah. And I'm just like, that, that was three years ago. And the guy was a I second think, round I think pick. Trey Mann does that. I, I like the trade, but it was, it, it was hyping it up. It was but, just, well, it's just know the language. The interesting thing of, is, is that was another one where he puts that spin to make it seem good they didn't get draft picks, and they still ended up getting draft picks. I my biggest yeah. pet peeve is when they just do a bit and piece at a time. Like I, they're so the the scoopers, Woj and Shabs, just them really are so obsessed. And Pat Bev Pod, Pat Bev, he was He's he a winner. included the necessary info. Um, so I've got they I've got first Dave so Ruddy's they'll just do agents. part of it. Yeah, yeah. I got to shout out Josh Beauregard Bell. I wow. don't know what you, I don't know what power Josh Beauregard Bell's got because I'm looking at his client list here. JB, uh, there are there are two NBA players, one of whom is David Ruddy on his client list. The Ooh. other is Jose Alvarado. Ooh, um, he snuck that does in not there scream, just like Jose. It does not scream out the kind of juice needed to get, you know, your playoff rotational hey, piece line in the tweet. You get that first text in, you get anything you want. I actually like the Hayward trade for the Thunder. I mean, they, they were never going to spend a ton of assets, but I thought, like, if he's healthy and it's a big if, he will help. And the guy, the stuff they gave up is just very – it was Misich. Misich, he's not going to get bought out, right? Because he has years left. I think only two guaranteed. One after this guaranteed – I thought I might have seen something about, or maybe it was just people asking if the Bucks could sneak into that trade. He's been very whelming for expectations. Uh, Trey Mann, Bertans, who is floating salary, and then draft comp. I think one or two second round picks is what, which OKC has a billion. If Hayward plays in the playoffs, like that, actually I think helps them quite a bit. I mean, he's a, a good player still. Not I the think same it's a, it's it's low cost, and you get a potential mm-hmm. like you get a vet, and it doesn't. Like, for this. It, yeah. Crucially for them, it won't cost in the future. So they'll – because they're going to need money to pay all these young guys. They may trade – I mean, this isn't reporting. It seems like Giddy would be the guy they trade eventually. That's a whole other thing. But this doesn't tie them up, which is also the same with Philly getting um, – uh, Buddy Heald. Yes, thank you. Buddy Heald, he's expiring too. So they get their precious cap space. And, Chris uh, Haynes reported right, they yeah. will pursue Paul George if he is available, which obviously – Who else? Yeah. If we're if we're rounding out contenders, we didn't talk about the Celtics. They get Xavier Tillman. They get Jaden Springer on uh, this trade deadline. But they gave so. up Delano Banton and Lamar Stevens. These are, those are basketball players. I kind of feel that way about the two guys they got too. I know. I'm just. I'm, I didn't say Xavier they're, they're Tillman's good. shooting splits are god awful. He's a good and defender. Not, he's fine. He's uh, a good defender. I know he's not out there to score, but I uh, know. It's like it's for the for the non KP minutes. It's Horford and but I was confused because I thought they like Cornette and they've gotten a lot from uh, Keda Keda on a two way as well. But that's the thing; it's a two way. I mean, just convert him if you like him. I think they have a roster spot too. After all, I think Tillman's better than Keda. I wish they would release one of those other two guys, and the Bucks could sign them. I'll say that. Yeah, that's that could be a uh, Javon Carter situation where. Oh, a contender wouldn't let a useful guy go, but maybe he fits a different role in Milwaukee. I think Cornette would help. Like I think Cornette would be at, close to those other guys we talked about, at least. As yeah. much as we make fun of the stupid jumping thing he does. He's solid. They had him. Who? The Bucks. Yeah, the they Bucks did have when? Cornette. When? Like two the, years ago. The 2021-22 year. He was like on a 10-day because yeah. of all the COVID. Uh-huh. Oh, injuries. that's right. Yeah. Is a great hoop crids answer. Oh man. Did he play a game? He yeah. played like one. Played like three. Yeah. Yeah. I completely erased that from my mind. Was that post boogie or pre boogie? Post. Because yeah, they got rid of boogie, and then there was some time there. I think. Boogie was the start of the ten days. Yeah. That year, so it has yes. to be post. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot there was they, there was some guard wing they brought in too. I remember I've never seen this. They signed Jeff a guy Dowden. With, who? Jeff Dowden. Yes, and they had him play with the they herd, had, which is yep. so unusual. Very. Unusual. I I I don't know if I've ever heard that name before. He would be a good guy. Let's look at him with this open spot. We he probably talked about well. it. He he's I, uh, a, he, he I really tears him it. up in the G League. I'll tell he you. He does. That. Yeah, he's he's a uh, uh, what is it the. 
quadruple A. Quadruple like A, the, yeah. yeah. The Lindell Wigginton, I fear. Xavier Munford types. Mm, that's a great name. Oh, James well. Young. Ooh. Jalen Adams? I could I could sit here. I've oh, watched a lot of these going. guys. Oh, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Are these your Mason, contenders Frank for the Open Rush spot side? Frank, Frank Mason we're doing is here? five A's. A, 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 A. Oh, that's a G League MVP right there. Yeah, that's. I'm not making fun of Frank Mason. Bonzi yeah, Colson. Right. No. That's a that's, that's a French A's. League MVP right there. Yeah. That's true. Brosberg. Bonzi is better than a lot of guys who are. No. You know, no. I watched him play a lot. He's big. He did this as a he did the. That's better than a lot of guys. He did the antlers. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, do we have, uh, if we're doing this, do we have anything else we need to talk about? Well, on the so. spot, on the spot, yeah. biggest. We can extend this out to non deadline because that throws in Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, who just had surgery on uh, his elbow. Yeah, so he's out for a couple of bones. Biggest move or biggest biggest move of the of this trade season. During the season. Yeah. And what team do you think, I guess, got the better? Oh, yeah, it's Siakam. Yeah, I think it's got to be. I think OG's up there. I mean, I think he did change that team. We'll see if he can stay healthy, which has always been. I think it's one of those two for sure. I mean, the other contenders are, I mean, Rozier, I just feel like changes nothing for the Heat. I really don't get it. I have a level of curiosity about Buddy Heald. That's just obviously Philly is completely tied to well what's Embiid's yeah. rest of the season look mm-hmm. like. But if Embiid is back and looks like Embiid and if Buddy Heald is good, like that's a that's a, a good team. potentially pretty big deal. I guess. you can't uh, you can't clown Buddy Heald for his playoff dropping because there's no experience there. We'll see. Oh oh yeah yeah. Um what I thought the play in I don't think he's Played there either has no. he? He might have with the Pacers. I don't think so. They didn't make it last year. It doesn't matter because they, they didn't don't make count it the stats. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess the Pacers fans were like, were had gotten to a point with Buddy, like Bucks fans have with Pat, and to a lesser extent Bobby. Like there was rejoicing when they traded Buddy. The numbers don't really reflect it. Still thirty eight percent from deep, but I guess defensively, and I will say. Don't really remember making any impact in the 50 games the Bucs played against Indy this season. Yeah. So I, we'll I, see. Yeah. It's, it's easy cheap, to rejoice when, when you got Siakam as well, right? Like yes. Yeah. Still, I don't know. There's something about that team. They're, they're not quite there in terms of their life cycle. Yeah. Everything's well, think, still very new. I think Halliburton's still kind of getting back. Uh, they haven't That's, shot off like I expected either. Same. But um, I'm not going to... Not going to be worried about it for them, and it's you know obviously it's not just a this year move for them either. But I, I expected a little bit of more of a like, oh, we're we're juiced now. The Knicks to me are the, to see them actually have a vision for play, like putting together like a very capable playoff roster, even with injuries to like Julius Randle dislocated his shoulder. I know he's supposed to be back somewhat soon, but like that is still like a very you never really know what's going to happen there. But they have a really deep roster, and I don't necessarily want to play them. Like they're, and they're obviously feeling putting everything together now. Like they're, The Cavs have really st- stolen the spotlight of like a team that's figured everything out and gotten through their kind of early turbulence. But It's interesting to me both of those teams that have been red hot have to add guys now. The Cavs because they're getting healthy and the Knicks because they made trades. I don't think it, you know, not doing the makes them worse or whatever, but it's it's an adjustment. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I think the, the Knicks not having any of those young guys anymore is like they're not all they have all the picks, but they're really in now like a, we're going to win with this core, we're going to find a superstar, and we're not we're not waiting on Grimes, we're not waiting on Quickly, we're not waiting on RJ anymore. Like this is the we're core. just gonna go do it. Yeah, yeah. Which is cool for them. They're credit, very yeah, good. They pick a direction. They picked it. They might have it. And I that forty eight deal. I remember. I think we even were. That was our free oh, yeah. live stream mm-hmm. a few years ago. I was like, "What the hell are you doing?" But knowing how things work, of like just having the salary to move something like that, make make something like today possible, where they get a good wing shooter and. 
Boyan has had playoff moments, even if it's only been first round against the Cavs when the Cavs were at their worst in the LeBron era. Oh, yeah. But, I don't know. We I don't know. Know the depot was brought out. Speaking of that series. I think he's crunching books tape right now. He might post again. I don't know if he's going to be ready to play at all this season. It's, it's unfortunate, but he's available. That was during the Bucks series, right? Yeah. God, these last nine months have been something else. <laughs> Retaining things have been awful. Okay, it's been, a, it's been a whirlwind. It's been a whirlwind. Rohan's itching for the outro. Take us home, <laughs> Rohan. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for listening to this episode of uh, the GSPN. Uh, it's fun crossover. We are happy to have you guys covered for this trade deadline episode. Look out for more stuff going forward because guess what? The season's not over. A lot of stuff to come with the Bucks. Possible roster move, all this fun stuff. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed to wherever you're listening to this podcast platform of choice. You're watching on YouTube. Check out gspn.info if you want to uh, check out all of our other podcasts. Speaking of big trades, the Milwaukee Brewers <laughs> made a big trade. Mm. If you want to uh, hear Adam and Andrew talk about the Corbin Burns trade, make sure you check out Cruising for a Bruising. Uh, again, link is at gspn.info. So uh, once again, thanks to everyone for listening. Pod Random, and we will talk to you next time.